From the moment I put on a virtual reality headset, I was inside an experience so extraordinary that I became devoted to trying to figure out just what that was and why it felt like it mattered to me so much. What was apparent immediately is that virtual reality is a work in progress. It's an idea more than it is a technology, and it's a seismically new way to understand ourselves and the world. Virtual reality is a term that was first coined by a playwright named Arto. He was referring to all of the word, worlds that we construct in a variety of contexts. These can range from immersive theater to a diorama in a museum to a viewmaster experience of a national park. They're all three-dimensional simulations. When we say virtual reality today, we're typically referring to a high-tech headset in which you can look around, move around, or change a simulated world. You can look around the world by sitting or standing and having a 360 live action or animated film play for you. And you could add some computing power to that, get up out of your chair, move around, and then all of the elements in that simulated world would seem to move with you three-dimensionally. If you added a little more computing power and some controllers, you could actually change the elements in that environment. These tools in the hands of artists and creative technologists can be used to tremendous effect to create experiences that enhance our sense of connection, presence, empathy, delight, imagination. In other words, to make us feel more human. <laughs> that first work that I had seen was the groundbreaking Project Syria by Nani de la Pena, a journalist who was working with gaming technologies to create an experience that would transport you to a street corner in Aleppo, Syria. The audio she recorded on site was added to a 3D computer animation, and in it, when I got to experience it, there's a part of it where you're feeling like you're talking to a young girl, and yet a bomb goes off behind you. And even though it's a very crude-looking computer animation, hard to explain because you're not in the experience, it feels phenomenally real and emotionally resonant. And there's a reason that this works. There's a trick of our perception that VR is particularly good at exploiting. We're mammals. We have to balance ourselves. And because of that, even in a simulated world, our brainstem gets hit and the chemicals flood when we have to know where we are in place. It's actually related to how you can throw a ball and have it hit a target accurately. When you add this physical element to a narrative, it has a big whammo of a mind-body connection that makes your relationship to that story that much more powerful. So it hit me immediately. If I had had these VR tools when I was making Sweet Crude about the consequences of oil for the people in the Niger Delta, I most certainly would have used them because I want to transport you to that place right there. I want you to see the dock in the village of Oparosa where a murky, toxic landscape had once been a white sand beach. I want you to feel the gas flare, smell the acid rain, imagine the impending violence, and I want the whole thing to break, to you, to break through to you much more viscerally and much more quickly. And what I'm learning while watching and trying to make 360 documentary film, a very daunting thing, by the way, when you've been doing it the other way for a lot of years, one thing you learn is the filmmaker's losing control. The audience can look anywhere they want. And the camera is everywhere. In fact, when you look down, a lot of times you see the tripod because you can't get rid of it, and the filmmaker in the frame. Because now, instead of trying to frame a story out in front of you safely, you're placing the audience in the boat with the character. While making Sweet Crude, I was the filmmaker in the boat. While I'm making the brand new work that I'm working on now, I realize the audience is in the boat. There's something about that that means the auteur can no longer turn stories into safe, neat, clean pieces that you hold out in front of you and don't worry about so much. Not only that, you're barely implicated at all. In experiences like Mundruku, the audience is in the boat. This is a 360 documentary with the added sensory elements that makes it a perfect remake of the 1962 Sensorama. <laughs> in it, you're taken on a tour by the indigenous people of the Amazon to show you the fragile environment. That experience is greatly enhanced by the fact that you smell matcha tea and you smell diesel fumes. 
and the chair that you're in is being rocked in perfect sync with the story on the river. You also feel a warm breeze. All of this comes together to give you this profound effect that you really are on the Amazon at the same time that you're actually sitting in a chair at a film festival. You're both here and there. The term being used for this now is it's an embodied narrative. And I think that it really does make you more of a witness. You feel a kind of responsibility for the simulated world around you. Now, embodied narratives are extremely powerful, and they can be used to take you on a tour of the Amazon, or they could be used to take you on a tour of the Niger Delta, but you could use it to put someone in a first-person shooter environment. It all depends on intention and resources. The makers and thinkers who are trying to serve a different purpose are working to make empathy devices, imagination machines, radical ways of transforming your notion of point of view. Because this would be a human-centered way to develop this technology. This would be virtual reality for connection. And after all, from an evolutionary point of view, connection is how we're wired, not isolation. In this way, I'd propose we could use technology to mitigate the negative impacts of technology. Virtual reality, artificial intelligence, machine learning, they're all here. We can't pretend we're going to put a genie back inside a bottle. What we can do is commit to the idea that we're going to develop this technology for humans, not for profit and technology. Here are some examples of the people who are working in this virtual reality for transformation category. An early piece of 360 that's one of my favorites is called Notes on Blindness. And in it, there's a simulation of what the world might be like for someone who's vision impaired with an extraordinary animation of sounds in the room. It's so visceral that my memory of it, there's a kitchen in it in which you hear drips of water on a pot. And when I remember the piece, I think of it as though I had been in the kitchen, not as though I had consumed a piece of media. There's something about the way in which they achieve the sense of residue and physicality that's really important. In a beautiful piece I saw this summer called Beethoven's Fifth for Voyager, the 360 film environment is augmented with what's called a rumble pack. This, this means the artist can create a sensation in which there's a vibration throughout your body that's in sync with the music. It was made so that you could experience Beethoven's Fifth as if you were as deaf as he was when he wrote it. It's a transformational way to understand music and the deaf experience. I've heard, I've heard it be said that film is the art form that can most closely represent our dreams. I think that's true, but I think virtual reality can make them come true. In Birdly, you can fly over any city in the world you choose. I chose Rome. It's an incredibly fun experience. I know Rome well, so you can actually use your hands to articulate where you want to go, and I was able to fly over the Tiber River and say, there's the Colosseum, I want to head to the Vatican. And then when you get off the machine, embarrassingly, your arms are actually quite exhausted. <laughs> it's true. And you dream about flying for weeks to come. I really want one in my house. <laughs> then I got to be a seedling growing out of the earth in a really affecting emotional piece called Tree. Instead of an objective experience about trees and talking about how valuable they are, now you're the subject. You hear chainsaws in the distance, and you experience phantom limb syndrome as you're reaching up. If you take everything I've just told you about all those pieces, and now you add an actor to the experience, that would be a piece called Draw Me Close. The National Theatre of London has made this incredible piece in which you play a little boy, and the actor who's moving you around the room and playing with you is your mother. I challenge every single person in this room to do this experience and not leave crying. It's so powerful that when she's tucking you into bed, you forget entirely that this technology and that you have this headset on. In fact, you really feel like a little boy. So much so that it reminded me that a trope in literature and film that I love is the body swap. These are some of my favorites. In Prelude to a Kiss, it's a Meg Ryan movie, by the way, uh, there's a moment in which a young woman at the beginning of her life and an old man at the end of his lock eyes, and they both have a thought at the same time. I really do want to know what it would be like to be in your skin right now. Enter the machine to be another. It's a collective uh, called Be Another Lab, 
of artists, psychologists, technologists, who have come together to create what they call an experiment about self and other. They use the tricks and tools of virtual reality to give you the absolutely phenomenal sensation that you truly live in another person's body. When you're in the machine, the body swap, which they've used to have people experience life in a different gender, a different race, a different set of abilities and different、uh, disabilities, different ages. You look down at your leg; it feels like yours, but it doesn't look like it. The facilitators are touching your leg simultaneously, and the feed from your camera and the feed from their camera are swapped. So as you look down at your arm, it's actually not yours, but it feels like it. It is by far the most profound experience I have had in virtual reality yet. As I told you before, in VR, you can be both here and there, but in this case, you're in a third place. You're in common ground, a synthesis. Where the opposite has somehow rounded out, you no longer have a sense that your identity and the other person's identity are somehow intrinsically separate from one another. Part of the experience that's the most beautiful is with the mirrors. You're looking at a mirror, the facilitator pulls it away, and suddenly you're walking toward you, and you can genuinely feel a desire to hug that person. It's an absolutely stunning experience. <laughs> 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 Not the best place to land the line, stunning. <laughs> And back to reality-ish. Most VR is being developed for gaming, entertainment, and let's face it, porn. <laughs> And there's plenty of investment for this technology that's going to make money. But we risk never finding out why we, as a species, invented this thing. If we don't invest in the part that won't necessarily make money, because after all, if anything is this powerful, you have to do something more with it than design it to make money. And Seattle's the place to do it. <laughs> we have an embarrassment of riches here in the tech sector. Not to mention our robust arts and culture community, our reputation for progressive politics, our extraordinary natural environment. However. We also have some of the largest income inequality in the country, massive housing insecurity, transportation woes, and whether we like it or not, we are a laboratory. What kind of laboratory do we want to be? I say, let's be the Silicon Rainforest, where we develop VR for human good, where we put a fork in the ground and say we're going to see to it that this technology is here for our problems. We can't wait 10 years to solve our intractable problems. Connection is the new currency, and currency is what we're going to need to redesign our communities together. I've been working with Be Another Lab to start an experiment of the Be Another here in Seattle. We're going to do some community stories, and we're going to do the body swap and hear those oral histories. We're going to ask ourselves, what difference might it make to a city developing so quickly and so significantly as Seattle? If we hear one another's stories while we feel as though we're walking in each other's skin, virtual reality can make us feel more human. It can help us to connect, and it can deeply impact how we evolve. Imagine the possibility that human-centered virtual reality can bring us face to face with our best selves in this moment when we need it most. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.